Good afternoon. On behalf of all of us here at Carnegie Institution for Science, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual lecture. This is the third in our new series of talks by some of our world-renowned researchers. During these unprecedented times, we want to make sure that we stay in touch with our community of supporters. So we've created this virtual series to share our ongoing work, <clears throat> to give you an opportunity to ask questions and share your thoughts. Today, we're going to hear from microbial ecologist Will Luddington, who just joined our Department of Embryology in 2018. Will is an expert in the microbiome, the complex and incredibly diverse communities of microbes that surround us and live inside of us. Each environment, whether it's a person's intestines, a fruit fly's gut, an office, or even a patch of soil, has its own unique microbiome. And these communities of microorganisms constantly interact with each other and with their hosts and are often strongly interdependent. As you can imagine, the human microbiomes are incredibly varied and complex. Our individual microbiomes are shaped by our genetic inheritance, our, our living environments, our interactions with others, our diets, and the, so the variables are many. So many microbiome researchers are using animal models that give them some control of these variables, which gives us a clearer picture of the ways in which these microbes interact with their hosts. Will's research focuses on fruit flies, which have a less densely populated microbiome. And in his research, he has partnered with mathematicians to construct frameworks and new ways to visualize this, how the microbiome evolves. And he's also been working with bioengineers to develop new ways of looking inside of live fruit flies to really understand how these interactions happen in, in situ. So through his research into the interactions between microbiomes and their hosts, Will is gaining an important new insights into the ways which the microbiome affects health, it affects fertility, and also affects longevity. Will came to us from the University of California, Berkeley, where he held a BOAS research fellowship. He earned his doctorate in cellular and molecular biology from the University of California, San Francisco, and he did his undergraduate work in biology at Stanford. Over the two past decades, microbiome research has revolutionized our understanding of biology. This is a fascinating and very important topic, and I'm looking forward to hearing what Will has to say. So please join me in welcoming my colleague, Will Luddington. All right, thank you. Um, that was a really nice introduction. Um, let me get my slides up here. So, go. And I just want to get the, make sure that this is working. Is everyone seeing? Uh oh, let's try again later. <laughs> let's see if this will work now. Good. All right. Sorry about that. So um, that was a, and can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. All right, cool. So that was a, a great introduction. Um, uh, and one of the things that I want to talk about today um, is model organisms, um, but also uh, the, in the value of model organisms, but really, uh, I think everyone today is thinking about uh, microbes um, in, in a really bad way right now because uh, we have this whole pandemic going on. Um, but uh, those are the viruses uh, of humans. And, and I want to talk to you today about uh, some microbes uh, that actually do us a lot of good uh, and live inside of our bodies. Um, and so actually the, uh, the first image uh, you're looking at here um, is from Jessica Mark Welch's uh, work. Um, at Woods Hole, um, what you're actually looking at is the inside of somebody's mouth, a biofilm. So all these Well, colors... can I interrupt you for one oh. second? Yeah. You're in the presenter mode, so uh, could you switch to the um... yeah, that. notes on that in the Q&A? <laughs> oh, you're looking at Thank you. Um, let me new share and see if this will... Well, let me share this other screen. Is it working now? No? Yes? All right. Good. All set. Good. Sorry yeah. for the interruption. Thank you for interrupting. Uh, you have seen all of my notes. Um, 
so let's see. Um, hopefully nothing embarrassing is in there. Um, but well, this is very personal. Uh, this is a very personal thing because uh, this is a microbiome and everyone has a unique one. Um, so the inside of this, this mouth here that we're looking at, all these different colors, each color is, is a different type of bacterium. Um, and uh, we can look, we can see just uh, at, at first glance is that they're not all evenly mixed. It's not like uh, there's some, it's like a, it's not like the static on your TV screen. Um, instead, uh, you see these patches, uh, and can you see my mouse actually? Yes, all right, cool. So um, here's a bunch of pink stuff all together, and there's some green stuff around it. Um, so there's spatial structure. So, so there's, there's something actually, you know, a rigid spatial structure involved. Um, we also see these patterns of, uh, for instance, this, these green guys are encrusted in this orange guy. Um, and uh, you can see that pretty much anywhere you go find a green guy, you can find, well, if you find an orange guy, you can find it's encrusting uh, some green guy. Um, so these, it suggests that these bacteria have evolved to live with each other. And that when they run into each other, you know, out in the wilds of your mouth, uh, they can act, they actually, it sets up a program that they have evolved to do, which is to cooperate together and work together. So these interactions are actually evolutionarily programmed into them. Um, and so that's the key thing I want to talk about, uh, you know, as a microbial ecologist, but really as an ecologist, a community ecologist, I like to think about interactions. And just how do interactions affect fitness? So one way as an ecologist that we think about interactions affecting fitness, here's a bunch of cartoons of bacteria um, and the, the arrows connecting them are showing that there's some kind of interaction going on. If we have a plus sign here that says that this bacterium is helping this other bacterium. And this is a mutual, uh, mutually positive relationship uh, both bacteria are benefiting each other. So if I were to do an experiment where I dumped a bunch of extra this guy into this uh, mixing pot here, I would expect that we see more of this guy around as a result. And then because this guy has a negative interaction with this other guy over here, well, I'd expect that dumping more of this guy in actually is going to decrease the amount of this guy. And so there's indirect fitness consequences of, of the uh, interactions between these bacterial species. So there's other kinds of interactions going on as well. And one that geneticists talk about a lot is called epistasis. Epistasis means that we have two genes that are affecting each other's function. So if we have, for instance, a pathway, a genetic pathway inside of a bacterium that, you know, it produces some, uh, it, it allows the bacterium to digest a certain sugar. If it takes two enzymes to do that, we could have uh, one enzyme A encoded by gene A, another enzyme B encoded by gene B. Um, in this case, they're both affecting phenotype C, which is the ability to digest some sugar and to use it as an energy source. And so if I were to take either one of these away, I would see an effect on the bacterium's fitness uh, when that sugar is, is present. And so what this is another type of interaction, a genetic interaction, that is affecting fitness of an organism. So a different scale at which these interactions can occur. And what's really cool and interesting about the microbiome is that we have a bunch of genetic interactions genetic interactions that affect the fitness of individual bacteria. We also have interactions between back different types of bacteria that are affecting their own fitness, the effect of each other, and also they're affecting the fitness of a host. For instance, uh, providing B vitamins. A bacteria might only provide the vitamins that the host needs when another partner species is present that might, for instance, feed it uh, some kind of a precursor molecule, some kind of nutrient that it needs in order to make that B vitamin or be stimulated to make that vitamin. So there's all sorts of interactions at all different scales and they're all important. But one of the, one of the problems with the microbiome is that sometimes the interactions aren't working the right way. And so microbiomes can be associated 
with uh, human diseases such as obesity, type 2 diabetes are very common ones. They're also associated with global nutrient or biogeochemical cycles, which are related to global warming. And so, for instance, if we have an algal bloom, uh, it could produce, uh, it could change the amount of oxygen that's produced, or it could put toxins into the water. These are all interesting things that are involved, that involve the interactions between bacteria, um, bacteria with other algae, with other organisms. So it's a very complex problem to try to understand the microbiome, but it's also very important, uh, not only to our health, but also to the health of our environment. And so the microbiome is, you know, really taken uh, biology by storm uh, in the past couple decades. And we know a lot of what we know because of advances in deep sequencing, uh, gene sequencing technology, genome sequencing. And so the way we know a lot of what we know about the microbiome is that we can take a microbial community sample and we can extract its DNA. Now, I should say that a lot of what we know is about human microbiomes and a lot of uh, these human samples uh, look like this guy. Um, but uh, we can take any kind of microbial sample and we can extract the DNA. The DNA is the genetic material uh, that defines the genome. It defines all the genes, all the biochemical functions, the, the ability to digest sugar, the ability to resist antibiotics. That's all encoded in the DNA. And then what we do is we take that DNA and we basically read it. But in order to read it, we need to actually amplify it. We need to make more of it in order that our machines can actually do that reading. And so what we do, we have this process that's basically, we have an enzyme and an enzyme is like a little tiny, tiny microscopic machine that is encoded inside of the, uh, in the genome by a gene uh, in, the back, in a bacterium. But we, in, bi in uh, biotechnology, we make lots of enzymes. They have all sorts of purposes. And so we use one uh, that's basically like a photocopy machine and it goes in and we give it a, an index, like we send it to the library of these genomes, of the sample, and we feed that, uh, we put that, that DNA in with that enzyme, as well as the barcode of the, uh, of the book it needs to get. And then it reads, it goes in, it photocopies it a bunch of times, and that allows us to read it. And so each genome has a unique signature on it. And by going in, by taking the DNA, amplifying it with these enzymes, then we can actually read the DNA and read all the barcodes, all the, that define each of these bacteria. And that lets us then take that information and we know each, the barcode, we know that it's associated with a certain species of bacterium for each one of these barcodes. So we've got you know, thousands of, of these barcodes that we're reading. And then we can put those into our database and it pops out and tells us what are the abundances of each of those barcodes in our sample. And so it's this really complicated process, but by doing that, we actually, uh, and it's become a very routine thing to do now, um, we've been able to examine the microbial communities of thousands of different environments and, you know, hundreds of thousands of different people. Um, and so that kind of information has allowed us to, for instance, understand how our microbiome changes as we age. And so one of the key things that we've uh, been able to figure out is that the number of bacterial species as we age is relatively constant after the first two years of life. And so actually it really starts when we, when we start to eat solid food, we become colonized with the bacteria and many of these bacteria are gonna stay with us for our entire lifetime. So we ourselves are like this, this complex ecosystem and these bacteria are living within us in this, in this environment. So, but it stays relatively constant. What's interesting is that uh, the, all these different individual people have different microbiomes, have a different signature of bacteria. And here's some data from a paper where they asked whether these signatures of bacteria, now each data point uh, represents an individual person and their microbiome, their unique signature that we got from the sequencing. And what they're comparing in this paper is a set of people who have either normal physiology or an obese physiology. And we can see is that these different signatures, each dot is, again is a signature, the red signatures, the obese ones seem to cluster together and the normal ones seem to cluster together. So if you picked a signature and if two dots are closer to each other, that means that the signature is more similar between them. 
And so if we have two dot, if you were to randomly land a signature right here, we would guess that you probably have a normal physiology. And if you had a signature, a microbiome signature, we sequenced it and it landed down here, we would guess that you have an obese physiology. But the issue here is that this is a correlation. So we don't know that the microbes are actually causing the physiology. This could all be due just to the diet that you eat. You know, maybe these guys just you know, eat an unhealthy diet and some of these guys, these blue guys that are mixed in here also eat an unhealthy diet and, uh, but they're not getting obese because maybe they just, you know, they burn it all off. Uh, maybe their kids are just running around like crazy. Like my kids in my house right now, running around like crazy and uh, just burning off all these calories. So um, we want to know if these microbiomes are actually causative of the physiologies that we observe associated with them. And the way we do that, not me, but, but other labs do this, is uh, they take an animal, and you may have heard of the boy in the bubble. Um, uh, back in the 80s, there was a kid who had no immune system. And so in order to keep him healthy uh, from getting sick, uh, he was kept in one of these notobiotic isolators um, in, a, in basically an inflated bag that kept him from touching any germs at all. And so what uh, researchers have been using these, uh, these bags, essentially these isolators for, is to take a, they make germ-free animals, animals that have no bacteria, fungi, viruses, or anything at all. They, they derive these animals and they rear them inside of these isolators. And then to try to prove causation for the microbiome, uh, this is work from Peter Turnbaugh, um, actually took the microbiomes from lean people and obese people and he, some of the mice, uh, in, in some isolators, he would give them the lean microbiome, and in the other isolators, he would give them the obese microbiome. And then he measured how much weight these animals gained as a result of getting these different microbiomes. And what you can see here is that the, the my, mice that got the microbiome from lean people have put on less weight as they're growing. These are young mice, as they're growing up, they're, they're putting on less, uh, less body fat, actually. And the obese, the, Mice, same, you know, starting germ-free mice, genetically identical, they got the obese microbiome, they gained, they gained more body fat. And so this is how causation can be proved. But the really interesting thing here is that when we, uh, well, we now have a microbiome, but this is thousands of species. And so, or hundreds of thousands of species. So we don't know which organism caused it, if there was one or whether it was interactions between them. There's lots of remaining questions. Um, and so uh, what we, the challenge then is to try to understand this complexity and how, you know, not just individual uh, species, but also uh, how the communities uh, together work. Um, what we've observed so far is that there's lots of variation. Two people can have a similar microbiome and uh, have really different physiology, or they can have really different microbiomes and, and actually have very similar uh, physiology. And so really dissecting out these details uh, is, is the work that's ongoing. Um, and the complexity is one of the real challenges to overcome. So model organisms, uh, my, my lab does is work on model organisms uh, on, on fruit flies. And fruit flies have just five species that are stably associated with them. Um, and so we have isolated these species. There are things that you find in yogurt, lactobacillus, they're known to be healthy for you. Also, uh, things that make vinegar, acetobacters. Um, and uh, so these, this is this core microbiome that's actually not super high diversity. Um, and that, uh, that allows us a much more simple and tractable system to work with. So we know these lactobacilli are yeah, beneficial for our health. They prevent you from getting gastrointestinal diseases. They also lower the risk for uh, invasion by pathogens. They lower the risk for gastric and cervical cancers, which are mucus-associated uh, cancers. So uh, these are relevant to our own health, these bacteria that these fruit flies carry around with them. And then model organisms are so wonderful because we have incredible genetic tools available to us. We can, uh, we can basically turn on a gene in one cell type or another, turn it on, turn it off. Um, there's all sorts of incredible uh, tractability that we have for manipulating and understanding these systems. 
and really importantly, we can make germ-free flies, and then we can give them just the species of bacteria that we want to study. So um, I'm getting a little bit behind in time, so I'm going to jump through a little bit. Um, but the basic things uh, that I'm interested in studying and that my lab works on is how we get our microbiome in the first place. So I said, everyone's got a different microbiome. How do we get that microbiome? How do the interactions between the species uh, change the microbiome that we have? And how do those interactions actually change the physiology of the host fly? And so, again, we each have a unique signature, but how do we actually get that signature in the first place? So um, I think, let me uh, do a quick survey of the people whose faces I'm looking at. Should I move through to microscopy or should I tell you how we do our experiments? Uh, um, microscopy or, or roll it forward? Microscopy, we're going to microscopy. So one of the things we wanted to do is just look inside of the gut. And so I want to briefly tell you that we take these individual flies and we feed them specific bacteria and we've labeled these bacteria with fluorescent colors. And uh, so we can actually see them on the microscope, see these individual cells. I'm going through some of the ways that we do this. Um, but really, how, where do these bacteria go inside of the gut? We know that in the human gut, uh, there are different zones, different habitats, microhabitats, where different bacteria are more or less prevalent. And so these same thing, we wanted to actually ask originally, just, does the same thing happen inside of a fruit fly? It's so small, is it just a big mixing pot or are there local regions of habitat? So what you're looking at here is, is a CT scan, a CAT scan of a fruit fly. And what I want you to look at here is this is part of the fruit fly's gut, the very forefront, the anterior part of the foregut, the very front of the fly. Here's its eyeball. Uh, there's all these little, uh, you look at an insect eye, it has all these little hexagonal Eye, uh, little miniature eyes that are all put together to make a compound eye. Um, but we can see this gut moving through. This is the gut I'm tracing with my mouse here. You can see it looping around, squiggles inside of the gut. Um, if we dissect that gut out, uh, I'm going to show you this cardia region here, is right here. If we dissect the gut out, and the bacteria are now labeled in red, you can see that most of the bacteria are either in this cardia region or they're in the back of the gut, but really the vast majority by numbers are here in this cardio region. So there's a very specific location, just like in humans, where these different bacteria live. And so the next, so we want to understand really, so here they are, uh, again, a close up of this region. You can start to see individual cells uh, in red here. Um, they're, they're localized to these very specific kind of lines uh, inside of the gut. If we, uh, chop that gut and then we look at it uh, from a, a cross section. So instead of looking at the length of it, we look at a, a cross cut right here. It looks like this, um, where the individual bacteria are these black dots. There's a mucus layer, uh, just like in our gut. And there's fly cells here. There's also yeast, these are dead yeast that they ate. But you can see that these bacteria are packed into these uh, parts and we are seeing these lines, these furrows, because there's a bunch of yeast in the middle, but we have these bacteria, these black dots here, or these are coming out of the page at you, or the bacterial cells. So we really wanted to look and see how these bacteria get into these furrows and, and where they get inside of the gut. So what you're looking at now is this uh, collaboration with Lucy O'Brien's lab and Casey Wong's lab at Stanford. Um, this is a fruit fly. Uh, is, uh, can you guys see the video? Um, yeah, great, okay. So, the blue that you're seeing, it's eating this blue dye. Uh, and why is it not going anywhere? It's actually glued with clear glue to the cover glass. Um, and you can see uh, this fly has been sucking this dye in, and here it is pulsing in, uh, getting pumped by peristaltic waves of muscle contractions through the gut. And so we want to actually look at the bacteria inside of the gut. Here uh, you're going to see uh, the individual nuclei uh, of the fly in black. These are the individual cells uh, are in black here. And uh, we're going to look up closer at this crop region. Um, the mid-gut region is, is where we see these bacteria, mainly this crop region here is where we're going to look next. And you can actually see inside of this same living fly that you're looking at in, in, this, in these videos, 
Here at single cell resolution, we can see the individual bacteria. Um, and hopefully this video will play now. So what you're seeing is that now there's this vast empty space inside of here, but the bacteria are all stuck right at this, at this shell. It looks like a shell, but the bacteria are all stuck uh, right at the surface of the, uh, the, the layer, the wall um, of this organ um, where they like to live. So they're actually embedded in the mucus. And what we know about these lactobacilli is that they like to live in mucus. Um, and so here they are inside of a fruit fly, where now we have these amazing genetic tools to actually try to understand the, how the fly gene expression is influencing this, how the fly builds this structure. But now we can actually look at this structure inside of the fruit fly's gut. Um, and so this is, how, is you know, one species of bacteria living inside of here. Here it is in these packed, dense arrays. There's these blobs of these cells all together. We don't understand a lot of what this means here, but now because we have these incredible tools, we can look inside and see what these communities are doing. And I talked about this cardia region uh, in the front of the gut. So again, here we're in the front of the fly's gut. Here's a different species. Before I was showing you the lactobacillus. Um, now I'm showing you a different species of bacteria. Um, so they form, you see in red before we were looking at these furrows uh, where the bacteria go. Now, this green guy also, this acetobacter also goes and lives in these furrows inside of the gut. And so the question we had was, you know, if both of these guys like to live in the same place. What happens when the two of them go in together? What, do they, are they able to co, how are they able to coexist inside of the gut? How do they actually interact in these communities? And so Again, just showing you, here we are in the, this cardia region of the gut. It's all, all these bacteria in the, in the cardia region here. Not so many bacteria all the way back through the midgut. They're just kind of passing through back there. But this fly seems to have actually made this very specific place where the bacteria go. Um, and so here again is a close-up of that region. You can see the individual bacteria cells. They look like they're packed into that region uh, very densely. Um, I was looking at a, a, a little a carton of blueberries uh, this morning, um, and you could see that all those uh, fruits were just kind of packed in the same way um, that these bacteria are packed into these folds of them in the gut. So somehow they find this region, and they really go there. Um, so the next question was, you know, what do they do? What do the green guy and the red guy do when they're in there together? And here you go. So here's now, uh, again, here's that cardio region here where we've been looking a lot this cardio region. Um, and you can see here's uh, you know, these folds again, uh, these, these lines. You see that the green and the red seem to be mostly in the same places. Here's a region of uh, green guys is uh, there and not red guy. Here's a region with you know, red guy and not green guy. Looks like it's mostly red guy here, but you also see a little bit of the green guy. Um, so if we look in closer, um, again, we're looking at the cardio region, this, this region here that the fly really seems to have made specific for the bacteria to go to. Now we're looking at high resolution again. And you see the individual cells. And what's cool is that these, you know, the green guys are still packed into these tight arrays the way they were. And the red guys are also kind of packed into these same spaces, but they've kind of, they've got little subregions. So there seem to be specific parts where the red guys go and specific parts where the green guys go. It's like they each have their own you know, they're in a the little neighborhood together, but they each kind of have their own little spot that they go to. So there's a real spatial structure that seems to be governing this. And what my lab is working on now, this is uh, ongoing work, is actually how the fly makes these, these regions and how it actually is able to get these guys to cooperate um, and not just fight over the space and have one of them take over. Because it seems to need both of them uh, for its uh, fitness uh, in the environment. They both provide a fitness benefit to the fly. Okay, so that's kind of the end of uh, what I want to present today. Um, we started off talking about all the complexity that there is inside of the human gut, of how there's just so many different species, and they, they have these effects, but it's really difficult to really understand what, what one of those species is doing or how these interactions are important. Um, and then uh, uh, what I started to talk about then is that how, you know, how does one species get inside of the gut, and then uh, finished up with how do these interactions of the bacteria actually occur and it seems like the fly might be really mediating, playing the mediator role in these interactions. And so it's a way that we can really you know, use model systems, use this fly with these really tractable genetic tools as well as these really defined 
uh, microbial conditions where we can take a fly and give it very specific sets of bacteria. This allows us a lot of tractability to ask very precise questions about how these different processes work. And so with that, I want to uh, briefly say thank you to my lab. Thank you to all of you for listening and tuning in today. Um, and then I'm happy to open it up for questions. I also want to uh, thank my lab members, Rin Dodge and how long you did a lot of the uh, work that I presented uh, to you today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Will, for that fascinating uh, presentation. It's crazy to think about everything that's happening inside your body all the time that you're not really aware of unless you do what you do. Um, so we have a lot of questions, so uh, we'll hopefully try to get through all or as many of them as possible. Um, and people will be uh, welcome to email any questions we don't get to at the end of the program. So to start off with from Lawrence, we have a question about uh, what is the signaling that occurs between the gut microbiome and the brain? Uh, it, what is the process there? Uh, so that is a, a great question that lots of people are working on. I'd say that nobody really has an answer to that one. Um, there are lots of hypothesized uh, mechanisms by which bacteria in your gut could influence your brain. Um, uh, you know, there, you know, there are uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin uh, that are produced uh, in the gut. Um, they, so, you know, the bacteria are actually uh, producing um, precursors as well as you know, producing uh, a bunch of molecules that can get into your bloodstream. Um, they can go to your brain. Uh, the bacteria could, could also just be stimulating your gut to produce some of these molecules, which then go to your brain. Um, they could also be uh, you know, producing molecules that stimulate your immune system uh, in your gut, which then uh, could cause you know, systemic inflammation uh, in your body. Um, there's, there are so many uh, possibilities that I probably shouldn't even start listing them out, but um, you know, fruit flies and uh, germ-free mice are uh, these tools that people have developed uh, in order to try to ask a lot of these uh, questions precisely. And then, uh, you know, a lot of times you can find that some process works inside of a fly or a mouse. And then the, the next challenge is to see, you know, is that process happening inside of humans? Uh, and uh, is that process, if, it, if it's happening, is it actually uh, an important process happening inside of humans? Because there's, you know, relative importance of lots of things going on inside our body. And the bacteria are, you know, one component of that. Thank you. Well, I love it when our questions, we get questions from the audience that are right on the cutting edge of what professional investigators are doing. That's so great and such a sign of how sophisticated our audience is. Um, we have a question that I know will be uh, dear, near and dear to your own heart from Ross, who wants to know uh, what the impact of taking oral antibiotics is on the microbiome. So that's, uh, yeah, that's a question that we're interested in in my lab. Um, I kind of skipped through my slides uh, on, you know, the more detailed experiments that we're doing. But um, the, uh, so taking supplements, uh, supplemental bacteria, uh, in particular uh, probiotics, um, has not really been, proven in humans to do any real specific things. There are lots of studies that show some promising results. Um, you know, eating yogurt uh, is associated with good health. Um, there are uh, some nice work uh, showing that the lactobacilli in particular can uh, basically uh, kind of pre-stress uh, your cells to be ready uh, to deal with uh, uh, resulting you know, stresses that might come from other members of the bacterial community in your gut. They can increase the thickness of the mucosal layer. Um, there are lots of, uh, I think, interesting suggestions. Um, but uh, yeah, I was actually at a, 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 I spoke at a probiotics conference last year. And what the industry was really striving for, um, and I don't speak for the industry, but what I saw at the conference uh, was that they really want reproducibility. They really want uh, you know, the individual strains to be validated. There's lots of differences between you know, different strains of the same species of bacteria. So it may say Lactobacillus uh, ruteri or Lactobacillus plantarum on the uh, pill that you would take, but um, it's unclear, you know, even within that species, 
whether the strain that you have is going to cause an effect. And it's also unclear whether the strain that you take might have an effect in one person and not in another. There's lots and lots of research that remains to be done. I think that uh, overall, we haven't seen a lot of harm uh, come from taking probiotics. Um, you know, yogurt, uh, for instance, is can be considered a probiotic kefir. A lot of these things people have been eating uh, and fermented foods have been you know, associated with good health in general. So um, there's, uh, it's probably not hurting you. It might be helping you. But uh, in terms of specific benefits, it's very difficult to label uh, broadly uh, probiotics as being beneficial. And it's also, I think it's difficult uh, just with the labeling. Um, that's one of the things this, that they were stressing at this conference, but they, they really want consistent labeling um, so that consumers can actually you know, associate the pill they're taking with a study that was done. So great question, but again, and it's, it's answers remain to be, to be had in a lot of these areas. That's part of the fun of these Zoom programs is you really get to see science is just always pushing the edges of a boundary out um, on these questions. Uh, so we have several participants who have uh, written in and asked about uh, fecal transplant therapy and what the microbiome's role is in uh, that. It's something we hear about a lot in the news, so on people's mind. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so we talked about like yeah, introducing one bacterium uh, to a fly, which is yeah, kind of like taking like Ross's question, taking a probiotic, um, uh, and then the fecal transplant is like you know the whole conversion. So uh, I think you know some of the uh, um, some of the work that's made that had the most uh, press uh, has been these uh, Clostridium difficile infections, um, which I think most of the um, fecal microbial transplant uh, therapy has been tested. Um, so uh, I, I wish I had a, had a slide up to show you, but, but uh, you know, like this is just really, uh, you know, I think there's roughly half a million uh, uh, Clostridium difficile infections a year. It can uh, cause, uh, you know, intractable diarrhea um, and uh, it, uh, you know, antibiotics can actually, you know, cure a bunch of these cases, but an even better uh, treatment in terms of just the number, uh, the, the efficacy uh, seems to be these fecal microbial transplants. And now people are trying them with all sorts of different uh, things. I think they're being tried with uh, um, some uh, mental health issues even, uh, as well as uh, you know, obesity uh, fecal transplants. There's, uh, there are, I'd say it's a wild west of uh, therapies. Um, we don't know about, you know, like how well does the microbiome of one person uh, you know, it, your unique microbiome, how does that affect a different person? Um, I think, again, this is, a, uh, this is a question. There's a lot of active research going on. Um, there's a lot of really interesting uh, finding, really, uh, I'd say, su highly suggestive findings that there can be some interesting stuff. But there's also, um, if you just kind of look through the papers, there's also ones showing, you know, no effect. And I think it really depends on how the transplants are done, you know, what the uh, bacterial, what the group of bacteria is, uh, that was used? Um, did it come from, yeah, a good match? Was it checked? You know, I, I wouldn't suggest doing this at home. Uh, you know, th there could be pathogens uh, in uh, the, the donor community uh, of bacteria. So these are all uh, things that the research community and I think the, the drug uh, industry, um, the probiotics community are trying to address and trying to develop. Uh, but a lot of these things are still, I'd say, ongoing. Lots of it open questions right now. We have a question from Michael who asks, um, do people get their microbiome in infancy from their mother? Or if not, where, where does your original microbiome come from as, as a baby? That's a, that's a great question as well. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, there's some great work. Uh, I would recommend looking up work out of David Relman's lab um, at Stanford. Um, he's been uh, thinking about this a lot and doing some uh, careful studies on it. Um, so, and, and, to, and just to summarize some of what they've uh, found is that a lot of the bacteria you get or a lot of uh, what you get is based on what you're exposed to. Um, so the bacteria that you have in your gut are a result of, you know, eating or ingesting some way. Uh, Bacteria, you know, infants are often in very close association with their mother uh, um, after birth, and so 
um, a lot of the bacteria you're exposed to as an infant are coming from your mother. So there is a much higher incidence of uh, on the bacteria coming from the mother, but uh, there's plenty of other routes of exposure. The uh, early initial exposure, you know, the uh, infant is uh, drinking either breast milk or formula. Um, and so that can change uh, what bacteria infants are exposed to. Um, and then of course, when you get solid food, uh, the diet changes a lot. And so some of these bacteria needed the specific uh, um, oligosaccharides and other uh, nutrients that were in the breast milk or the formula and uh, those nutrients aren't available anymore. So those bacteria that might have originally colonized might go extinct um, and not be present again. Um, there's, yeah, uh, I'd say ex if you want to think about where the bacteria are coming from, think about just what you're being exposed to. I think that's the key. But then as you're exposed to more things, it's kind of, you think of like the analogy of a hotel uh, as the rooms fill up, uh, eventually the no vacancy sign comes on and it's very difficult to get in. So each subsequent bacterium, uh, you know, each, each original bacterium is, is, you know, colonizing, but then there can be difficulties for the subsequent ones to get in. So two people could be exposed to the same set of uh, 10 bacteria, but in different order, and they could end up with different microbiome composition. I'd, I'd say there's yeah, lots of interesting uh, work on that going on. I don't think I'm going to be able to look at a no vacancy sign without thinking of this. So <laughs> you run out. Um, so we have a couple of questions from people who are asking uh, how the ecosystem of bacteria in the gut microbiome would compare to a bacterial ecosystem in a microbial mat or something like that found in nature. How the interactions or experiences would compare? Oh, that's a great question. So yeah, like the structures that you see in a biofilm are really different from the structures. You know, so I, I, uh, the, the first slide that I put up um, of, uh, I'm just gonna scroll through and get back to that slide. Um, this, is, this is a biofilm inside of a mouth uh, once I get to it. Um, and so, you know, there's spatial structure there. Um, this same group, a uh, couple years later after this paper, came out with another uh, very similar technique applied to looking at the mouse gut where they had fed these mice, you know, a certain uh, assemblage of bacteria that they were able to label and, and uh, image the same way um, as, they, as they did with the, this image of bacteria in the mouth. What they found there was that the bacteria in the gut were really evenly mixed uh, when they were looking through these uh, mouse samples. Um, so, um, when you think of a, a microbial mat, like an environmental microbial mat, um, there is this spatial structure. There's you know, zones of uh, where you know, different habitats, different chemical habitats, microenvironments produced by the bacteria. Um, in certain parts of the gut, things seem to be really well mixed. Um, and so uh, really uh, where some of the structures are seen, or kind of more, I'd say maybe more hypothesized to be is in these crypt regions, uh, which is kind of like what we're seeing, I'm now scrolling back to find the fly gut um, image that I showed you. Um, so uh, yeah, so actually here, so human gut, um, things are, you know, these things aren't necessarily attached to any structure in the human gut. They're kind of seem to be persisting and they can, you know, kind of stably persist because things are squishing through here. There's mixing, things can actually kind of stay in place just by proliferating and being pushed around by fluids. So they can actually maintain a population. But there's other regions of the gut, like uh, you know, what we see here in the fly, um, where we have you know, a really strong zone of, where there's spatial structure. Um, and so that's probably, there's probably regions uh, in other animals, these, these crypt regions uh, in mice. Um, there's some uh, work from Justin Sonnenberg at Stanford and some work from Sarkis Masmanian at uh, Caltech who've shown these crypt regions uh, in the mouse gut where bacteria, certain bacteria seem to be living. Um, but I'd say, you know, like there's limited tractability for dissecting those, that spatial structure. Um, in the fly gut, you know, we have these regions where there's, you know, seems to be not a lot of spatial structure, you know, going, this is the mid gut here, um, but there's also regions where there seems to be a lot of spatial structure, like so there's in the cardia and in the hind gut. So I think that, uh, you know, comparing uh, what we see inside of the gut to uh, microbial mats, uh, you know, there's probably some regions where that's uh, the case, where there, where you do see spatial structure developing, and there might be there's other regions where 
might be more of a story about mixing um, and fluid dynamics. There's some really nice work in zebrafish um, from Raghu Parthasarathi and uh, Karen Gilman um, at University of Oregon uh, looking at zebrafish where there's a lot of mixing that's going on determining the structure of the bacteria in the gut. So, yeah. And to the folks who asked us that question, there were two of them, we will have a, an expert in microbial mats coming not in the next program, but the one after that. So uh, come back again and <laughs> ask that person from the other side of this. So we uh, just have time for one last question. Uh, and we have a lot that we didn't get to. Anyone whose question we did not get to, please submit them via email to events at carnegiescience.edu. And we will pass those questions along to Will and make sure to get answers for you. Um, so I'm going to ask Will the last question, and then after his answer, our Carnegie President Eric Isaacs is going to give some concluding remarks. So we have an email question from Niels, and this is a very timely question, who wants to know, uh, we're all paying attention to a novel virus for which we have no immunity. In the normal course of life, uh, what role does our microbiome play in fighting off diseases? Um, I think any microbiome researcher who is, uh, who is uh, submitting grants is probably thinking uh, <laughs> about submitting a proposal uh, uh, to try to answer that question. Um, so uh, there is, uh, I guess, yeah, there's some um, interesting work out of Sarah Cherry's lab uh, at University of Pennsylvania, uh, looking at the interaction between the microbiome and uh, viral uh, susceptibility. Um, there are, uh, yeah, I guess I, I should... Uh, maybe stop just name dropping, but I think if you guys want to just be looking up uh, these other researchers um, who are doing this kind of work, um, uh, the microbiome has been yeah, shown to be involved in kind of, you know, setting our uh, viral defenses, uh, you know, regulating our immune system. There are some interesting interactions. Uh, say again, there's another area where, uh, you know, the you know, we start things a lot of times in fruit flies, and then uh, somebody picks it up and does a similar study in a zebrafish, or does it in a mouse. Um, we try to, you know, prove again that, you know, this, some mechanism that we see occurring uh, is actually relevant in these other systems uh, before it actually gets taken into humans um, to do that kind of research. Um, so, uh, yes, there are, there are definitely linkages um, in terms of uh, setting the type of immune response. Uh, and the, the level of the immune response. Um, again, uh, a lot of this is uh, kind of preliminary uh, work, um, but there, uh, there was a uh, study out of China that I, I just uh, read the abstract of uh, uh, suggesting that there is a correlation between the uh, human microbiome and the severity of uh, coronavirus disease. Now, uh, I showed you that there is a correlation between uh, human microbiome composition and obesity uh, um, in terms of the you know, gut composition and obesity. Uh, so it's hard to know whether there's, or any of these uh, are direct effects versus uh, indirect effects. Um, but of course, the immune system uh, is involved in a lot of the mucosal uh, interactions with uh, the mucosal uh, tissues in our body. So um, there's Lots of reasons to be excited about that. And uh, for any specific case, uh, the devil's in the details. So again, I point you to some of those interesting uh, researchers to look into, um, but uh, I'd say no 100% sure answers yet as well to that question. Thanks for the question. So uh, Will, thank you very much for that, uh, that really excellent and very clear uh, discussion about the microbiome and, and its importance in general. I also want to thank our participants for wonderful, wonderful questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them, uh, but we really appreciate you joining us for this virtual conversation. Uh, I want to also invite you to come to our next one, where two of our astronomers, uh, Gwen Rudy and Nick Conadaris, will be talking about uh, a new and very unique type of instrument, infrared spectrometer that they've been designing. It's an instrument that they'll tell you about, which will be used to for a lot of things, but in particular, to measure atmospheres of planets in our Milky Way around other stars, but also to be able to reach back into the very earliest galaxies in our universe to start really understanding how, how we came to be where we are today. So again, thank you all for participating and we look forward to seeing you again.